Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful two days uh, now. Uh, this is uh, the third day of our conference and the second day of, of the academic program. Uh, I'm here to introduce our keynote speakers, but before that, I wanted to say a uh, few uh, very practical things. One thing is that uh, today afternoon we will have workshops uh, and there is uh, registration for workshops. It's still open, so those of you who haven't uh, uh, registered for a workshop, uh, you can do it at the registration desk. Uh, yes, that was all. <laughs> <laughs> but now, uh, let me introduce you our uh, keynote speakers, Thomas Erasuris from Universitat Andres Pello and Ricardo Crine from Univers Universitat San Sebastian. Uh, Thomas Erasuris is a professor at Campus Creativo at the Universitat Andres Pello. Uh, with a background in history, architecture and urban studies, his research revolves around material culture, domestic life and sustainability, particularly focusing on dynamic nature of the objects and places. He is a founder, uh, a co-founder and uh, active member of uh, Cosas Marviolosas, a wonderful things, a collective dedicated to promoting sustainable living through the research, recognition, and care of our everyday environments. He also serves as a, the editor-in-chief of the uh, Green Handbook, a compendium of uh, recommendations for re reducing household consumption and leading a more sustainable lifestyle using existing resources. Furthermore, Thomas directs Bifu Garciones a uh, publication house dedicated to urban cultural studies. And yeah, this is the Manuel Verde, the uh, Green Handbook, uh, published very recently. And uh, Ricardo Crine is an associate professor at the Universitat Andres San uh, Sebastian. Uh, his academic background is in sociology, anthropology and urban development. He has produced films uh, and published books and articles about urban culture, visual methods, elites, races, daily life and material culture. He serves as a director of B. Fuchs a journal and publication specialized in urban studies and uh, urban culture. And he's also a co-founder and active member of the Wonderful Things Collective. Also, he has overseen notable visual anthropological projects such as Santiago International Documentary Film Festival. Uh, they have been closely uh, collaborating in their research projects and applied projects and also exhibitions uh, that focus on sustainability, everyday life and material culture. In their work, they often advocate for more sustainable consumption practices and reveal the, the material, social and cultural causes of these sustain sustainable ways of living. Their exhibition, the daily use that we have here at the Student National Museum currently, is dedicated to the uh, countless lives of newspaper in domestic settings. Uh, and through this exhibition and the research article on this topic, they propose that besides the right of re repair, things and we as consumers should also have right to repurpose. So I think it's a very great example of, uh, from their work. Uh, uh, also, they have studied uh, reuse, repurpose and repair in domestic and rural settings and outside of market economy highlighting domestic and vernacular creativity, innovation and ad adaptability in the face of the changing environments. And the, their keynote speech uh, is titled Care, Adapt, Survive. I'm very honored and very happy to welcome you. Please 
uh, Thomas and Ricardo. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction. Uh, well, the, the title change. <laughs> Caring for things. Uh, well, well, we'll first like to express our gratitude to the Estonian National Museum for hosting this Congress, and especially to Tenno uh, for his lead leadership in bringing his, this initiative to life. Tenno first mentioned uh, this idea to us at a conference years ago, and seeing it realized today speaks of, to the dedication and vision behind this event. Well, today we'll be discussing uh, how advancing sustainable practices isn't just about adopting new consumption models, but above all, about recognizing and reinterpreting traditional marginalized and low impact practices that persist among communities with minimal responsibility for a climate crisis. So once again, many thanks and let's dive into the conversation. Well, it's no secret, the link between how we consume, how we produce, and the toll it takes on our planet sits right at the center of today's climate crisis. Our current economic systems, well, they've been pushing us towards unsustainable patterns, using up resources at a rate that left ecosystem reeling. Deforestation, pollution, mountains of waste, we have heard all of it. These aren't uh, isolated issues. Unfortunately, they're all part of a larger story of biodiversity lost and a warming planet. But on the other hand, there's a shift happening. Well, in recent years, we're seeing countless efforts rise up in response to global call for change. Unfortunately, most solutions we hear about still fall back on the same familiar framework, market-based approach. Now, what do these actually do? They often aim for economic growth with a dash of sustainability mixed in, but without tackling the deeper roots of overconsumption. Think about it. 20 years ago, the economist Tim Jackson pointed this out, warning that sustainable development was being framed as consuming more sustainable products. And yet, here we are. This discourse remains the dominant approach. This vision of a green economy keeps pushing for growth relying on theoretical improvements in resource efficiency and nudging industries to be more responsible. We see discussions about indicators, certifications, recycling networks, consumer education, and supposedly collaborative business models. There are some certifications there, you can see. When it comes to building a circular economy, much of the guidelines have been dictated from the top down. The focus, industry, the goal, Cut down waste, squeeze more efficiency, more from resources, recycle and generally industrial reuse of materials. Necessary steps, absolutely, but let's consider do these policies go far enough? The truth is, these strategies often lean on compliance, favoring a tech-based fixes within the same market-driven frameworks. The real question is, are we just reshaping production processes without challenging and underlying patterns of consumption and behavior that contribute to this crisis? Leaving this industry aside, when it comes to consumers, most initiatives focus on two ends of the process, acquisition and disposal. On the acquisition side, the push is to change habits, replace certain products, buy those with eco-labels. At the disposing end, generally, it's all about recycling, with a burly enough to composting or material recirculation. But here's the kicker. It's been a while since we know that none of this truly ensures a cutback in overall consumption. Oddly enough, very little attention goes to what happens in between buying and tozing things out. The whole use phase practically ignored. And yet, as we observe, in the incredible exhibitions we visited on Wednesday or in the presentation yesterday, that's where much of the potential for real change lies. I love this image. <laughs> If we had to grade government and international in sustainability policies, they'd probably top the epic fail list of that YouTubers love. Let's face it, the results have been underwhelming. Many critics are calling out the green economy's limits 
when it comes to the climate crisis. Back in 1992, world leaders gathered at the Earth Summit full of promises for sustainable development. But here we are, 30 years later, or 32 years later. And what happened? CO2 emissions and global temperatures keep climbing. It's a reality check that reveals just how far short these policies have fallen. Luckily, not everything hangs on governments, international organizations or big industry players. Over the past decades, grassroots movements have sprung up using social media to spread the word and validate new ideas and practices. They're promoting everything from reduced consumption and degrowth to non-market forms of consumption. And here's the part that often gets missed. Many of these movements emphasize what happens between buying and disposing, caring for what we already have. They show us that, that citizen-led efforts can make a real difference, championing community-centered, sustainable solutions in face of the crisis. These citizen movements often spring from younger, highly connected professionals, many of whom hold significant social and cultural capital. Through social media or other networks, there are, super, there are spearheading initiatives that are shape, reshaping consumer responsibility, showing that it's possible to care for and influence our environment in real, tangible ways. These efforts highlight the importance of practices like care, repair, sufficiency, self-production and solidarity economies as tools to re reduce environmental impact. Now, what's remarkable is that these practices, which might once have seemed old-fashioned, are now being reimagined as acts of resistance by eco-conscious groups, especially in developed economies. They offer an alternative, breaking away from the usual market-driven path to sustainability. But what about the communities and groups we don't hear much about? Those less visible in the media, where care, frugality and sufficiency are still part of everyday life. How are they able to sustain these practices? And how aware are we of these alternative lifestyles that might actually hold answers for the climate crisis? Imagine if we shift our focus to the local, the situated, the seemingly, seemingly insignificant. There are communities that make mindful, responsible use of resources, showing us another way to live more sustainable. What, would, what could we learn from them if we only paid closer attention? Why not bring more visibility to validate and reframe traditional and subaltern practices? These practices, deeply rooted in the majority of the world's population, offer powerful, often overlooked tools for reducing consumption and environmental impact. Care and resource maximization, repair and reuse, solidarity, cooperative consumption, and a more balanced ecosystemic relationship with the environment. These have defined human interactions with nature for centuries. It's only with the rise of overproduction and consumer culture that these practices have been devalued. Not only have they lost social worth, but modern consumer society has built deep cultural barriers, sidelining anything that doesn't fit modern ideals of success. Think about it. As a society, we are drawn to what's new, urban and wealthy. But why? Why have we preferred the fresh over the familiar, the bustling city over the quiet countryside, and increasing wealth over sufficient means? In this worldview, the everyday lives of those who are old, rural, or economically marginalized barely get considered in the sustainable dis discussion. Over the next slides, we'll look at several research projects done over the la last 10 years that explore these so-called subaltern worlds. Now, we're not here to idealize or gloss over the real challenges these communities face, marginalization, inequality, injustice, Instead, our aim is to uncover the rich ecosystemic logics of care and adaptation these communities practice, both to and from their environments. Might these practices hold keys to facing the climate crisis? We'll briefly present several projects, each challenging and rethinking socially constructed ideals around time, space and capital. Let's start with a simple but profound question. How do we, as a society, relate to time? 
And how has this relationship been shaped by consumerism? In a consumer-driven world, certain values and meanings dominate our perception of time. But do they serve us? Or do they drive us into patterns that only deepen the environmental crisis? Now, consider this. Why have consumer society instinctively associated all with negatives like obsolescence, malfunction or decay? Why is new almost always celebrated as innovative, secure and optimized? Isn't it strange how these associations have grown stronger, especially with rapid technological advances and environmental shifts? Although it may seem obvious, it's worth asking ourselves, what's really behind this preference for the new? And at what cost do we hold on to it? The faster industry moves, the more firmly we seem to cling to these values as if new is the only way forward. But let's think for a moment. Does everything truly change at the same pace? Are the places immune to the rapid turn of market forces? For me, one such place is my grandmother and grandparents' house, the focus of our first project. A few years ago, I stumbled upon this photograph from my aunt's and uncle's wedding in 1967, taken right in my grandparents' living room. As I looked closer, something struck me. Every piece of furniture, every curtain, even the rug was still there, and mostly in the exact same place. It made me wonder about my own home, where discarding and replacing things every few years felt like the norm. At first glance, my grandparents' house might seem like a heaven of a stability, but is it really? The truth is more complex. The house and everything in it aren't static. They're not just things that are. They're things that are constantly becoming, shaped by both human and non-human forces. Imagine it. The furniture, walls, even the smallest objects aren't simply preserved. They're constantly adapting, reacting to light, dust, wear and care. It's a kind of slow transformation, one that asks us to rethink what stability even means. In response to these slow transformation, we see the emergence of what we might call strategies of stabilization, maintenance, repair. My grandparents' house is a living example of space that demands constant attention. At least that was the norm a few years ago, back when my grandmother was still active and caring for it. Let's think about the everyday objects in my grandparents' home. Clothes are carefully stored with mothballs, Shoes and boots kept in boxes stuffed with newspaper to keep their shape, just as you saw outside. Delicate tapestries, covered, only to be revealed on special occasions. Wooden mattresses are refilled. Sofa springs are straightened. In this household, wine glasses have their own special storage, separate from everyday dishes. Every item has a designated spot, chosen based on its value and function, to ensure it's safe and accessible when needed. Following Jonathan Chapman, this routine of care and maintenance creates a codependence between people and objects, a relationship grounded in trust and necessity. In my grandparents' home, nothing looks like brand new, because it rarely is. Not even when it's first arrived. These objects have a life a story. Wear and tear is accepted as long as the item still works. The worn wooden floor, the dull aluminium pot, the kitchen counter marked with scratches and strains. As Junishiro Tanisaki observed for all Japanese houses, the visible passage of time on objects can bring probably a sense of calm and security to those who live with them. In contrast to today's norm of disposal and replacement, In this household, repair isn't just an option. It's often the only viable path. The house has specialized rooms set aside for manual work, filled with parts and materials, what might come in handy for future repairs. And when a task is beyond the family skills, well, there's a network of specialists to call on. In this home, there's little concern about whether repair will increase or decrease an object's commercial value. Repair happens because within this logic of care, it's simply the right thing to do. To consume means to repair. Interestingly, 
Most repairs leave traces, visible marks, and show objects have failed, decomposed, or broken at some point. But in a household like this, where repair is woven into daily life, these marks don't carry the same disruptive meaning that they might elsewhere. There's always something to fix, and there's no direct link between damage and disposal. Technological obsolescence is rare because needs don't change dramatically over time. Functional obsolescence might lead to repair, disassembly, or repurposing. An old fridge can become extract storage. The oven might hold pots and pans. And well, as for aesthetic obsolescence, it simply doesn't exist. Here, throwing away items into so much effort has been poured is unthinkable. Even things that seem to have no immediate use or no longer function are kept because they can be repaired or transformed in the future. Discarding something into what so much effort has, uh, and, and care has been invested, well, that's simply not an option. And well, there's always the possibility they'll come, become unuseful again. They will only leave the house together with my grandmother. But let's pause for a moment to think. What's wrong with things that aren't new? Used, old, or even vintage items play a crucial role in the ecosystem of possessions people keep at home. A couple of years ago, we conducted in-depth interviews in Santiago, Chile, talking with individuals from various socioeconomic backgrounds. We wanted to understand how they acquire their possessions and how they let go of them when no longer needed. To our surprise, many of their belongings had lives that extended well beyond traditional markets. These items entered their homes after passing through others' hands, and then, when no longer needed, continued their journey, often landing in other households. These networks of circulation offer a quiet but powerful alternative to consumer-driven market. What we found was that most used items didn't flow through conventional buy and sell markets. Instead, they circulated through alternative channels. People gather items left on the streets or in public spaces, inherited belongings passed down across generations, and shared or exchanged possessions among friends, family, and acquaintances. These methods of circulation reveal a robust, informal economy one that highlights a different relationship with material goods, one based on sharing, preserving, and repurposing, rather than constant replacement. What truly caught our attention wasn't just the widespread use of alternative circulation channels outside formal markets, a common practice in Chile, especially among non-elite groups. The real surprise was the strong connection between second-hand items circulating through these channels and a set of care practices that profoundly shape their life cycles. Here's second-hand goods aren't just about reducing new purchases. They carry deeper meanings, embodying acts of care, social support, and personal histories. These practices reveal a pathway towards a more sustainable system, ones that operate beyond traditional market-driven approaches. One key finding revolves around the role of social bonds in fostering attachment to second-hand items. Unlike new goods, these items often carry the stories of previous owners, fostering connections that go beyond the material. This emotional association can generate a sense of corresponsibility, where caring for the object feels almost like an obligation. There's also a desire to continue the item's journey, passing it on to others, out of solidarity or reciprocity. In this way, second-hand items become part of a shared narrative, contributing to a sense of community and mutual support. Another fascinating discovery is the commitment people make to the value of second-hand objects. Unlike new items, which typically depreciate, many second-hand goods gain value through upcycling. New owners invest time and resources to restore or enhance the item, creating a sense of ownership and sometimes even emotional bonds. Second-hand goods aren't just a cheaper option, they're a catalyst for a different relationship with material goods, one rooted in commitment and longevity. 
When we look closer at these cases, it's evident that the dominant narratives around old or used items are largely cultural constructions. These narratives lose their hold when we explore how such objects fit into the lives of people less embedded in consumer markets. What we typically label as old or obsolete, marked by deterioration or uncertainty, can instead signify resilience, adaptability, security. Meanwhile, new is not only about innovation and progress, it also brings disruption, disconnection and environmental cost. This shift in perspective challenges our conventional views, or at least the dominant one, on what material value really means. Now let's shift our focus to the categories of rural and urban. This distinction has taken on even greater significance with the expansion of cities and the spread of urban lifestyles into areas that were once separated. Although few places remain entirely untouched by urban influence, we can still observe a gradient. Some areas are tightly connected to cities while others retain varying degrees of isolation, allowing for more autonomous ways of life. This race in connection to urban centers shapes not only the rhythm of daily life, but also the resources and opportunities available to these communities. It's no secret that urban life, while offering access, well-being and freedom of choice, also brings pollution, overexploitation of resources, ecosystem degradation and a growing disconnection from nature. These are issues we've been aware of for some time, yet the urban ideal persists often obscuring the full cost of convenience and growth. But perhaps what we're missing is a deeper appreciation of the rural. Instead of being peripheral, disconnected or isolated, rural life often embodies rootness, a conscious and creative use of resources, sustainable ways of living, collaboration and a wealth of local knowledge. These qualities offer resilience, adaptability and a profound connection with natural system, elements essential for sustainability, but too often overlooked. We know very little about how consumption unfolds in rural passing spaces. In these areas, the circulation of objects is notably low, access to new products is limited, and the items that do arrive often stay indefinitely. In two separate projects, we conducted interviews, guided tours and planimetric and photographic surveys in rural homes across Chile's Central Valley. You might expect these spaces to feel static, but what we found was the opposite, a dynamic relationship with domestic objects and the surrounding environments. Tools, technologies and knowledge all play essential roles in sustaining continuously reproducing their homes. In these settings, most objects that shape the environment are either handmade or modified by the inhabitants themselves. New items are rare if they exist at all, and everything requires constant attention and care. This hand-on relationship with objects fosters a deeper familiarity and understanding. It's a far cry from the disposable culture we see in urban spaces, and it invites us to rethink what it means to own something. Here, ownership is less about mere possession and more about nurturing, responsibility and care. What if we could see beyond objects' intended purpose? In rural areas, this kind of vision is common. There is a creative, attentive perspective on materials and things. Many of our interviewees were able to see potential in objects beyond their singular or origi original form, recognizing their sensitive and practical qualities. From there, they could imagine new uses, transformations, adaptations. This way of interacting with objects, seeing them not just as they are, but as they could be, reveals an adaptable, sustainable approach to consumption. In many isolated rural settlements, objects that would be discarded as waste in urban areas hold fundamental value as raw material for daily life and construction. Reuse isn't a deliberate attempt to go green or counteract a linear economy. It's simply a way of being, a practical relationship with inhabited environments. This embedded practice reflects a deep connection between people and their surroundings, where materials are continually transformed, repurposed. 
In a world where waste and disposal aren't part of the vocabulary, items that lack a clear purpose are seen as raw material or material in transition. The future, their future value depends on the creativity, skills and capabilities of the residents. In these settings, the lines between maintenance, care, repair, reuse, they just blur. There are no lifespan definitions. Objects live in a fluid state, normally open to transformation. This continuous intervention in the environment finally reveals a profound interdependence between people and objects, each shaping the other to adapt to a constantly changing world. Through their practices, our interviewees develop a unique knowledge of the material world around them, taking active, active responsibility for it. This relationship is not a passive one, It's deeply participatory. By understanding their materials so intimately, they embrace a responsibility that goes beyond mere ownership. It's a way of life that prioritizes connection and adaptability. Tools and the knowledge associated with them become extensions of the body, expanding the inhabitants' agency over their surroundings. These tools, often handmade, are adapted from found materials, reflect a blend of practical knowledge and creativity, reinforcing values of self-sufficiency and resilience. Rethinking the rural world as a source of insights for a new relationship with our environment demands a critical look at the material and spatial forms tied to our urban ideals. What are the underlying materialities of values cherished in the modern urban life, such as hygiene, comfort, security, autonomy, and social distinction? This line of questioning takes us to reconsider how these values are constructed and maintained within cities. Could rural practices shaped by necessity uh, or by rudeness rather than access reveal alternative, more sustainable ways to embody these ideals? It's no secret that urban life, while offering access, well-being and freedom of choice for some, also brings pollution, overexploitation of resources, ecosystem, etc. Uh, these are issues we've already talked about. But perhaps what we're missing, again, is a deeper appreciation of the rural. Instead of being peripheral, disconnected or isolated, rural life often embodies a rooted, place dependence, a conscious and creative use of resources, sustainable ways of living, collaboration and a wealth of local knowledge. These qualities offer resilience, adaptability and a profound connection with natural system. I'll leave you with Ricardo. Hello. So this, uh, I was just thinking that this is a room about uh, with people that works with repair, so you won't mind my, my broken English. Um, so I have never read before in a conference um, in English, and it has systematically proven to be a, a very awful idea. So today I will read, my apologies for that. So Thomas made these two basic distinction between uh, new and old and rural and urban. I'm going to move forward to the third one, which is about uh, scarcity and abundance, which is about resources. Um, categories that shape our understanding of resources, well-being and wealth. On the one hand, scarcity is often framed as a state of deprivation, a lack of, a lack of something, right? Uh, associated with limited resources. It is perceived as a condition to overcome. Abundance, on the other hand, is typically linked to ideas of access, comfort, wealth, and even luxury. It is an eager and a desired state to achieve. Both, of course, are quite specific, located and historically rooted meanings, and it's not hard to find other cultures or other times where scarcity and abundance did not occupy the place and value they do today. And it's important to, to I already move away from my script. It's important to stress that because um, we often think that we are like fixed, fixed with this idea, with the new, with the modern, with the uh, masculine, with the vertical. And it's quite relevant to keep on repeating that human life and human history is a kaleidoscope 
kaleidoscope. It's filled with stories of different ways of being. And we may have placed this thing now on the front. Uh, we have uh, made them like an ethic, a way of conducting ourselves. But we have conducted our lives uh, with different aims before, towards community, towards um, glory as well, towards money, towards uh, nature, towards healing, towards well-being. And it's important to stress that because once we realize we were different before, we can think that we can be different again tomorrow. And as David Graeber once wrote, uh, if we acknowledge that this is not the best world possible, then we are betraying ourselves by reproducing it. So it's good to find and, and realize that there are other worlds possible. So going back to my presentation. Um, so, Marx and Engels wrote that capitalism is the most, most productive economic system ever created, and yet is plagued by this idea of scarcity. Lack of jobs, lack of houses, lack of money, lack of goods. Under capitalism reigns the idea that anyone could be rich. Not all of us, but anyone. Uh, so, what lessons can we learn from scarcity? of those who cannot fully access the market. This study, what well, Tomas didn't mention that every time uh, the logo appears and a title, that's a different project we have uh, conducted. So this study investigated how different socioeconomical classes in Santiago, Chile, relate to sustainability through their uh, domestic practices. The paradoxical starting question was quite simple. Why rich families in Chile have greener discourses? but less ecological practices than popular households. So they talk more about being green, but they recycle less, they consume more, they throw away more things. The research focused on contrasting what we call open and close uh, homes, or what we call aesthetic ecologies of homes. The methodology involved qualitative research using in-depth interviews, guided tours, and photographic elicitation by examining the ways homes are organized and reproduced, we explore how cultural values shape sustainable practices, emphasizing class-driven distinctions in domestic space. And we managed to distinguish three relevant dimensions in which this aesthetic ecology of things operates. The first dimension is the material, and explore how homes are open or closed to tolerate the combination of different material, textures, and origins within space. In upper classes homes, a close aesthetic prevails, where materiality and material uniformity and pristine conditions are preferred, limiting sustainable practices like reusing and repair. They may agree to recycle, but they don't want to have empty bottles and packages lying around and play, play inside. Conversely, working class homes embrace a wide variety of materials, mixing new and used objects. Their open or more open aesthetic reflects a, great tolerance, a greater tolerance for visible wear and diverse objects, encouraging a culture of conservation and adaptation rooted in resourcefulness and material scarcity. The second dimension, functionality, address, addresses how different spaces within homes are used. So not that much in the objects, but in the spaces. Upper classes homes are usually composed of single function rooms with restricted adaptability, reinforcing a rigid domestic order. This setup resists multipurpose uses, making the integration of sustainable practices more challenging. Of course, this changed a bit during the pandemics, where different rooms were used for different purposes. But after the pandemics, things were back to normal. Working classes homes, however, adopt multifunctional spaces. You can see quite clearly, uh, where various activities overlapped. Living areas serve or may serve as places for socializing, for eating, for working, for working out, fostering a culture of diversity of objects and practices. This openness enhances resource efficiency and supports the circular use of materials promoting env environmental sustainability. At last, the third dimension is temporality, time. 
and refers to how homes deal with the passage of time. Upper classes homes strive for timelessness, constantly maintaining or replacing items to keep an ideal appearance. Wear and agents are signs to be erased, supporting a consumption-driven cycle. This is supported by the constant and invisible labor, which is quite relevant to mention, of domestic workers, whose role is to produce what we call a zero state situation, situation each day, taking everything back to where it belongs. So it, they, they move like in a, they have a, a circular kind of time, you know, each day starting again with everything back to its original or design spot. In plain contrast, working classes homes reveal the marks of time, integrating objects that show wear but remain useful and being tolerant, again, more open to the flow of things, many of which do not possess a clear defined position or place. This linear sense of time instead of the circular one allows for a prolonged use of resources, preventing the discard or of unused objects and facilitating conservation within everyday life. So let me ask you again, what do people do when they have almost nothing? As the tour through the museums two days ago uh, clearly show us, they, they manage, people manage, people resolve. They organize themselves and engage in highly creative and resourceful strategies to make the most of, out of the limited resources available. They reuse and repair, barter and trade. They grow food, they share what they have with the communities. Tomas has already spoke about this issue in the rural context, where isolation limits the circulation of objects and where practices of repair and repurposes often become essential for sustaining livelihoods. Yet these dynamics are not confined to rural areas, although in urban settings they, sh settings they show two significant differences. First, smaller living space spaces in cities mean less room to store tools and unused items. As a result, the city itself becomes a vital stage that facilitates interactions and it changes through various networks. This is the, one of the Instagram's project we have that is called Album de Chispesas that can be like broadly translated like uh, a witty album of uh, creative solutions, something like that. Um, and you can find a number of things that are created out of different materials. For example, these are milk powder tins filled with concrete to do weight lifting. Um, and those are globes that are stuck and glued into the uh, bike handle to prevent cold. You can uh, follow us, uh, Album de Chispesas. We have a couple of hundred of different solutions. Um, the second difference between the urban and the rural uh, lies in the composition of these networks, which extend beyond acquaintances to include strangers, which that doesn't happen that much in the rural settings. Public spaces, informal markets, and social networks play pivotal roles in enabling the movement, repair, and reuse of materials and objects. Thomas also talked about second-hand objects, but let's take a brief look at this other research project we just published um, in the Journal of Visual Communication, which we conducted during the 2019 social revolt in Chile, and where alongside objects, it was knowledge or ways of doing that circulated among these strangers. During the protests, which I mean, moved like over a million people out to the streets, the, uh, lacking the proper equipment to confront the police and the police violence, uh, violence, a myriad of everyday objects were repurposed to express collective discontent and challenge power structures. Protesters transformed kitchen utensils into loud instruments. Yeah, the former one. This is not a, you know, it's a kitchen, yeah, it's a cookie tin. Um, urban furniture into barricades and various objects into protective gear, gear against police violence. These are shields made out of, the, that's an oven tray, um, the lid of an oil barrel, that's the, the, the cover of a heater. 
uh, we also find a number of uh, satellite uh, dishes, plates, yeah. Also, urban furniture being transformed into barricades and leaving a patina uh, stain on the streets, a mark. <coughs> so people learn new ways to use daily objects through social media and other global circulation channels, which allow for the rapid dissemination of ideas and tactics, like how to neutralize tear gas grenades that came from that year Hong Kong's protests. Also, how to use, for example, the la la laser pencils to uh, mess up drones. This material subversion highlighted the key role of daily life and urban objects in social upheavals, disrupting the established role, order of and redefining public space. So let's go back to our witty album to show and discuss another project which you already know, hopefully, because it's posted outside these walls. So viewing and re reviewing the thousand images shared on our account by people, we re realized there were a couple of, of industrialized objects that kept on coming. They, they took all the attention and they s insist on like, showing up. They were common and cheap things like tires, like plastic bottles, like plastic bags, supermarket carts and plastic fruit crates objects that were relatively easy to get and reuse, and their possibilities were really like infinite, like newspaper. Take this device, for example, we found in Cuba to scare away flies, which is the, it's an artifact, it's a, combina it's a machine really, a combination of a string, a plastic bottle, and a plastic bag share to, as I said, to keep flies away in a butcher shop. So from that, that starting point uh, came our research on newspaper. Newspapers are an urban pro uh, object, one so as ephemeras, a name that emphasizes brief and fleeting life. Having as a primary function to communicate news, they are not expected or required to last more than a day. For that reason, they are printed on a cheap paper print that degrades quickly from exposure to the sun, moisture, and atmospheric conditions. It uses ink that is absorbed and dries quickly, allowing a fast, massive, and conveniently priced circulation. This program degradation may lead us to think that newspapers are disposable elements that become garbage upon, upon consumption. Nevertheless, as you have seen in Chile, as in many other countries, once newspaper main, fun main function to be read, well, I don't know now, because it's so, it's so uh, difficult to get newspapers now that people are buying it for the secondary uses. I mean, you have to move out, you go and buy a newspaper. Not to read the newspaper, but to pack uh, things or to clean the, the glasses. Um, but the newspaper usually was uh, silently stored in the hope of giving them future uses. Faced with the slightest need, they become raw material to be cut, bent, wet, tied or twisted, satisfi satisfying the needs of functions as diverse as decoration, combustion, health, insulation, beauty, leisure and cleaning, among others. The wide variety of the newspaper's alternative functions bear no relation with its original use at all, even the shape. Uh, to use Dominguez terminology, the newspaper as an object quickly ceased to be such in order to become a thing, a change in materiality that can subsequently be transformed into new objects. This process of customization demercantilizes the original product, minimizing the reference to what it was. As such, it can be said that it is newsprint, the paper, the raw material, and not the newspaper, the conception object, what is safe from garbage. And although this distinction may not seem unimportant, as seem important, it becomes the first symbolic transformation that breaks the dominant linear trajectory of buying, using, and discarding. In this regard, the newspaper was selected as a case study for us by us because it constituted a paradigmatic example of the potential that everyday objects we have around have for being reused and repurposed by us, by people. 
We can analyze it, take it into consideration, different knowledges, technologies, tools, components, actors, and ethics in which it is entangled, identifying four attributes that explain its mutability, its materiality, its shape, its access accessibility, and the shared knowledge associated with its uses and practices. I will not stop at that uh, uh, subject, but you can read the paper. Uh, um, so, to close this project, it's relevant to mention that under, under the banner of sustainable design, the industry has explored ways to increase the life cycle of products, primarily by reusing part of pieces in new products that serve the same function as the original, well, the recycling trend. The newspaper case opened up the discussion on how form and materiality could be taken into consideration so objects may easily become raw material once again, and therefore the basis for novel creations with completely different purposes. Um, additionally, it points out the importance of generating products that recognizes the consumer as an active agent in the resignification and generation of new life cycles for products. One of the, of the old men, who Thomas Schoen, the guy who was repairing in the countryside, we were interviewing him, and he took a, a, an old vintage like a uh, car, a toy car. And he told us, uh, this car, it's not easy to, to translate the, the, the word game, he said, but let me try. He said, like, um, this has repair, has, works in Spanish, this has repair. But if, if it doesn't have, to have repair, it has copper, it has aluminium, it has tin. So he could see the object, but also he could look further and see the raw material that composed it. At last, the study suggests the, import the importance of using forms and material which favor these active consumption experiences. To position the consumers as designers and producers, and at the same time to provide them with raw material, it is essential to think about the possibilities of a standardized, modular, and dis disassembly design, not only for industrial processes, but also for domestic ones. A different project. So to wrap up this section, let's ask about what about the scarcity? But not um, in a rural, isolated environment, not in a segregated urban environment, uh, neighborhood, but in a, at a global, collected scale. So when, when, uh, what about scarcity when you're not, uh, when you're part of a global supply chain, but probably not the most privileged part? This is Antofagasta, the largest city in the Atacama Desert, where 40% of the world's copper is extracted. One, one would expect, uh, um, with such title, uh, to find a rich city, but that's hardly the case, as you can, as you can see, and these are not cherry-picked uh, images. Not only the mineral and the revenues are taken out of the region, but the city and its people are also left with several problems, which they call, of course, externalities, although they are even, I mean, they're hardly external to the process, right? They are integrated, expected, and necessary parts of the whole process. So problems such as, such as environmental degradation, water, water scarcity, health issues, of course, and inequality, among others. But however, when we talk about these negative effects, in Chile, we always place the focus on the local. We talk about the, the water that mining industries are living, about cancer, about biodiversity, even though what we produce and make circulate has impact not only at a local scale, but also in distant communities. Agbovloshi, for example, which was presented yesterday by Steve, a large e-waste dump where hundreds of young people work as what they call themselves, copper miners. So it's not a dumpster, it's really a mine where the mining materials and things, and where they extract the mineral out of discarded objects, particularly cables, three kinds of cables. An important part of that copper, which end up contaminating their soil, making them sick, even killing them, 
comes from Chilean mines. Should we, we ask, be held accountable for that? For what we have put out in the world? I flew to Antofagasta last year, talked to the people, listened to their stories, and took photos of the city. I wanted to simulate a kind of postcard of the urban B-side of this rich mining. I didn't want to take photos of the mining, or the pipelines, or the ports, but of the other side of the mining industry, a portrait of the places and people necessary to the industry, but left in a way aside. Then this January, I flew to Ghana, to Accra, and handed these postcards to the recyclers, inviting them to write visual letters to the miners back in Chile. It's a long project, an ongoing project, so I won't stop that much here. Uh, this is one of them, for example, uh, highlighting the, the water and the natural resources and erasing in a way the city. Our lives depend on the water. That's an, an, a, a boy from Haiti uh, going on a bike on the main square in Antofagasta. Um, and this guy in Ghana thought he was African, so he said, well, I want to leave too and draw a plane. Um, this is um, a square, supposedly clean, because it was it built over um, a lead poison landfill. Um, and when I showed this, this image to the people, one of the guys picked them up, uh, picked it up and said, well, I want to write something, and he was quite mad, and I asked him, well, why? And he, write, uh, he wrote, no food for lazy men. Why did you, do, did you write that? Why, why do you want to send that message? Well, at that age, you should be working. You shouldn't be uh, having a good time in the square. I, mean, I was working and collecting things for my father's, father's parents. I also work with other people related to the, what, to the copper industry, with uh, artisans and also NGOs that uh, work with polluted uh, soil, for example, pure earth. This was uh, Blessing, it was called, she was called, um, Blessing. She worked at the Pure Earth Foundation and, and also sent a message about the water. This is a hotel used mainly by copper-related executives, and that's why they wrote. Money appears a lot, probably in part because of who I was to them, I think. You, have, you can't be invis uh, invisible, I mean, you can't be blind to that. Everyone needs money, but the problem is our health. Those are the cables, the copper cables. They didn't have orange uh, pencil. So this is an ongoing project, and we don't, have, um, we don't have much time to review it, as many other projects we haven't been able to present. But I wanted to show you a few images, because it frames the practice of maintenance, caring, repairing, and reusing on a different scale also. So we have seen many different ways in which people who are out, or at least not fully integrated into the market, reinvent their daily environment to manage their lives. And we are not at all, uh, that's not our intention to romantize poverty. There's nothing good about being hungry. We are asking ourselves, what can we learn out of this situation to build another world? What lessons can we learn to live a different life? Well, it is possible to live buying less and throwing away less as well. So for dec decades, uh, advertising and capitalism have promoted the three, at least three, probably more, dominant ideas about what it means to live a good life. That's a question, as I said, that every people, every generation asks themselves and probably answer in a different manner. First, the belief that we must constantly keep up with the new. No, always updating, always upgrading, always consuming. Second, the idea that a fulfilling life requires living in well-connected, vibrant cities, emphasizing urban life as central to progress. And third, the notion that abundance, having more, owning more, consuming more, equals happiness and success. So this dream have shaped our desires, aspiration, and ways of dwelling in the world. I'm not talking to the right audience here, uh, and have led us into an unsustainable situation. Perhaps what we need, among other things, is to shift our focus to, and look in another direction, valuing overlooked practices that we have tried to uh, think of today. 
perhaps also to find new words to name and embrace them. Perhaps it's not all mat mature, like the mature objects that Thomas showed us. Perhaps, perhaps it's not rural, but rooted. Perhaps it's not scarce, but sufficient to live a good enough life. Repositioning care practice is essential as we imagine alternative ways of living and thriving, thriving emphasizing care, whether for people, for objects, for non-human beings or the environment, can transform how we understand value and sustainability. By prioritizing practices that nurture and sustain, we challenge dominant narratives of consumption and waste, paving the way for more equitable, resilient and compassionate futures. Just, yeah. One thing that, that photo, we, we went to Cuba to, to do some research and we found it fascinating. Of course, we are not romanticizing anything, I think, but it's fascinating how, uh, uh, a, how in a country cut off from the rest of the world. Of course, that produces a number of problems and human rights things. Um, but at the same time, they have to manage to do everything with what they have. And you see the garbage on the streets, and it's all organic. Like there's not a single screw on the street lying down. And everything is fixed, and people know how to fix things. And if they know, don't know, they know someone who will, who will help. And we wrote a, a, um, an article about that in the newspaper in Chile, and we were highly criticized because of our past as you. I mean, we are linked to the uh, socialist and communist uh, government of Allende. Uh, that for part of the population is like highly stigmatized, for the other part, no. Um, but also, so we, in Chile, we, we, we were unable, in, in a way, to see the good practices that are behind uh, those discussions. Um, and, and we talked to Tomas um, about the, the tour of the museums and about the, the Soviet uh, past. Uh, of Estonia. Of course, we don't know much about Estonia. We have been here for three or four days. But yeah, it's... it's uh, and we also saw some of the, of the gardening uh, exhibi uh, presentations yesterday. And the way that people tend to move away as far as possible of the Soviet era because it wasn't easy, right? But also, it's good to, f to go back to the past to see, to look for things that we can recover that were good, um, especially in this kind of neoliberal uh, era. So a final issue, there are many things the academic world can and should do in this scenario. Uh, we may organize ourselves and others, we may share ideas and data and methods, we may reframe narratives, of course, challenging negative perception, like I said. We may do public advocacy, influencing policy, and we may do community engagement, we should. And one of the things we have been doing among others in our collective that is called Wonderful Things is to explore alternative ways of co-producing and disseminating knowledge, attempting to move beyond the tyranny of peer-reviewed journals and chapter in quite expensive books. Uh, one of the, the things is the daily use exhibition, one of the examples, previously open in Chile, now in Estonia, we're looking for a new place to take her, uh, and each iteration, in each iteration, the data, the participants, and we, we believe, have somehow grew in different ways, learning novel things. Um, here's a short animation of a series we produce in collaboration with the Oscar-winning studio Punk Robot uh, about newspapers. Another exhibition we made was Wonderful Thing Spring Season 2021, using the language of retail 
we occupy six large uh, showcases with domestic objects classified in kitchen, dining, garden, and storage. Every item was picked out because it related to our traditional Chilean practice of reuse. For example, the T-shirt that evolves <laughs> uh, into a pyjama when it wears out, and then into a floor cleaner where it becomes too unfit to be usable, uh, which is a label my, my wife and I often disagree. Uh, with. Um, here's the design gallery at the museum where the exhibition was held. You can see the, the showcases. Uh, to edit the exhibition catalog, we review hundreds, like 500 retail magazines and pick up different phrases, which then we, in a way, subverted through the uses of images. Because they are, these are things that are not for sale um, and which you can make by yourself. One of the videos we produced to promote the exhibition. Um, oh, I think we, yeah, it's not working. We realized earlier. The table, table is, a, is a kneading board for making bread, uh, placed over two bottle beer crates. The checker pieces are soda bottle cups, and the chairs are made of different uh, parts and pieces. And this is a thing you can see in the streets. Finally, with Tomás have been running for a decade now, a publishing house of urban cultural studies. We have published like 30, 35 books. And this year we decided to open a new brand that is called Cosas Maravillosas, uh, devoted to produce books, books on material culture, sustainability and domestic environment. Uh, the first title just published is Manuel Verde, the Guía Verde, Green Guide, through practical guidance and tips accessible to all households, the manual uh, aims to change the way we relate to food, clothing, electronics, furniture, decorations, and so many other item, items we keep at home. The idea also is to open probably a website where we, we can worldwide share our tips and ways of doing things and learn from each other. So um, that's the presentation. I hope uh, it has been interesting for you. Of the, from this other part of the world, of how we do things, perhaps not that different from what has happened or what is going on here. So, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ricardo. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, we have now uh, approximately 15 minutes for Q&A session. We will be uh, okay. sitting uh, there. You can have a <laughs> glass of water with Thank you. Thank you. So this is actually an um, open Q&A session. Yeah. Uh, so you are very welcome. To, uh, to ask, to discuss, to reflect. Uh, so, uh, oh, but I, I can start, uh, <laughs> if I may. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, reflect back on uh, Stephen J. Jackson's uh, talk yesterday and and uh, uh, and about um, rethinking of hope and hope uh, in terms of uh, uh, continuous. Uh, maintenance, repair, care practices. Uh, and I was, I was thinking that uh, mm, you mentioned that uh, things at home, uh, very often they, they have uh, you know, extended life and they, they uh, transform. And in a, in a way, even you can say that maybe they flow in, in a material sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think is, is this... Uh, how relevant this link would be uh, with your uh, research uh, material, the link between hope and material transformation? I think well, we, we, found, we have found different motivations to do things. Um, for many people, as Thomas said, this is a way of life, of doing things. Well, also Steve say that hope is a way of, it's a muscle, you say. I like that. So, I, I don't know if it fits with your idea of hope, because uh, it's also like a, at the same time, it's a touch and a detached process. It's something you just do, but it's relevant to you. 
So, um, and at the same time, that's what that's that the, the larger part of the population we have to do res research with is, fits to that kind of, of of idea. And then we have the other kind, probably the more educated and and, and middle class and upper class families who are now very consciously trying to change the world, to think about their kids, uh, to survive. Um, and yeah, and, and for them, perhaps, I, I think it, one, one, one guy told me that he has an, a frustrated optimist. So <laughs> he was hope in a way, but at the same time, like a f cracked and failed hope. Like I'm doing this because I have to do something, but I know, I know it's not enough. Uh, and I know it doesn't depend on me, like to change. I mean, then you have Taylor Swift, like doing <laughs> 300 jet flights uh, every day. Uh, so what about this plastic cup? Uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, but it's an ethical way of conducting yourself and your life. Um, so no, I don't know the larger effect of that, but uh, in a way it's, a, it's, it's linked, I think, to hope uh, and to think of a, of a different world even though you can or you cannot build it by yourself. Uh, but it's a way of, of ethically moving around. Yeah, I was thinking also in hope. And now that you mentioned uh, Stephen Jackson uh, talk yesterday, it, I, I for, forgot about the muscle, but I remember <coughs> like that, thought, that hope is practical. Mm -hmm. Hope isn't just a discourse and probably that he, he like is very precise. Uh, we are very precise in that. It's like we're very used to hear that if humanity has hope or doesn't have hope, if this crisis is going to end with everything, and the discourse is always like in a supra uh, global level, yeah, and, and, and very conscious, uh, rational. But in a way, hope. Uh, is again, it's practical, but it's it, it's not only practical in, in a theoretical way. It, it's practical in in my life, in in your life. It's like it's what we do to our environment. It's how we do to our environment. So, uh, for for example, uh, now now I'm starting a project about manual work, like how we intervene our domestic space. And trying to think that perhaps doing textile or gardening or construction work, it's all part of the same. It's all intervening mm. and being able to have hope that what I have and where I live can mm. be different to what it's now. And it's, it's very little. It's like maybe tomorrow I'll finish this little work and have something different. So... It's not something far away, it's there. And I can do it, and it's not conscious. I'm just doing it. Uh, and care is that also. Care, care, the logic of care is that you're not rationalizing something. You're not, it's not a discourse, it's something you do. At the same time, obviously, it's, it's not easy. And it's not without frictions, and of course, frustration. Uh, Sometimes you don't have enough time to care about things. You don't give yourself much time. I'm doing a research now on, on, on the thousand, over four, no, 30,000 people who left the big city during the pandemics to the south of Chile. And I moved there as well to, to do the research. Uh, and I'm doing a, a documentary series about gardening. And it's fascinating because for, for the people from the urban environments, they move and that garden, that 5,000 meter, square meter garden, it, like, it captures all the desires they, they had before moving out. Like, these are, this is my, pack, my new pact with nature. This is the place where we, I, I, I'm going to put my hands in the dirt, in the earth. But at the same time, it's not easy. It's, it's a cold place, and I, I went a couple of weeks ago to film... In a, in a woman's house, uh, and she made uh, seven big, I don't know how you call it in English, but big, big, like, wooden boxes to plant different things. How do you call that? Bancales is called, I call it in Spanish. Um, 
and, and she built that like a year ago, and now six of the seven are thrown away. I mean, they're, they are useless, and she had only one with like these really lousy tomatoes. Uh, and she was quite cold to go outside and, and, and work on the, on the, on the, on the land. On the, so she was quite frustrated, but she kept on going. Uh, but I mean, it's, it, everything we have shown is not, it's a, it's a job, it's something you have to do. It's some, it's, it, re, it, it needs disciplines, it needs a, um, a frame of mind, it needs time. I mean, caring needs time. I mean, it's, that's the most essential thing of caring, it's time. You, know, you give time to your kids, you give time you, to your friends, that's caring. And you have to give time to your things as well, you know, to, to take care of, of your shoes, to take care of, uh, of everything. I mean, how, for example, I, 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 I usually break my, my sweaters because I just take them off like that and they tear down. So <laughs> if I would give myself like five more seconds to take this out, uh, I would take care of it. But yeah, it doesn't always work. Sorry for the example, it's yeah, stupid. Sarah's question? Uh, hello, again. Uh, I had a comment about this uh, Soviet, you mentioned uh, yeah. the um, Soviet period and, uh, and the experience people had back then. And I'm born in Soviet period in 1982. I lived only 10 years in the system, but still, um, I think one thing which I, I felt there was that uh, the fact that everyone had the same things mm. was so frustrating. Everyone was trying to escape it. Uh, <laughs> that we, we, we became great to escape it. And then now we are back in, the, or we had uh, gone this full cycle where people buy stuff from Ikea. And it's all the same. <laughs> and I'm always wondering how come that we were so struggling to get out of it. And now we are somehow back there. And also the other thing is that, um, which I find now fascinating. Now to have the same. That's the difference. Yes, but uh, <laughs> I mean, the other thing is that I have a teenage daughter. And I had been doing all these things you mentioned, like uh, gardening, repairing, uh, doing their own food and Master furniture food. and everything. And uh, as when we did the renovation, her first uh, request was that, can I have everything from IKEA and clean and like <laughs> nothing from the reuse? And then I was wondering, like, how come? <laughs> like, because... Yeah, what have I done wrong? Or I'm wondering, will it then happen at some point? I don't know, well, maybe in 10 years that she will wake up and, and think that, ah, oh, but there was a point. Or it's, it's somehow we are all the time here this, uh, having this hope and positivity, but then I have this experience in my own life where I really have this feeling like, what have I done wrong? <laughs> and uh, the third thing what I wanted to say is that I think uh, especially um, what I had seen in the last times, there is so much um, talk about global warming and uh, how, how we are all going uh, to really wrong direction as, um, as global society. And then the, <laughs> this famous sentence is here is, I don't see the global warming. It's so cold winters. Yeah. How do I am connected to to uh, problems in Africa with no water? I have so much water. We have rain all the time in here. And then this uh, impossibility of people or incapability, yeah, incapability to see the, my uh, connection to, to Chile, to copper, to phone, to use of the phone. Mm. All this is, I think this is such a <laughs> frustrating situation. <laughs> I think it's quite interesting the question of why and how did we start wanting different things? Because that's, that's the norm for the humanity, that has always happened. People wanting different things? Probably not. Not everywhere, not every time. Um, regarding, sorry. No, no. About that? Or? No, yes, yeah, so like the, the values of this time, like of modernity. Like I always think in comfort, mm. in like what is to progress, uh, 
the importance of the urban, of rationality, uh, individualism. There's a very nice uh, piece by also David Graeber when he, he wrote about, he's, it's called like, why don't we have flying cars? And he stated that in the 80s, like innovation stopped because not, not really innovation. It's not what capitalism wants. We want the same things. Um, and regarding the other question or, or comment or remark, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a difficult scenario, uh, these hyper objects, the objects, the, these hyper phenomena that are quite larger than us. So on the one hand, like the climate crisis is too big for us to solve it no? by, ourse by ourselves. We feel that like, it's not on our hands in a way. Perhaps Greta knows that she can do it, but I feel frustrated. Uh, so that may lead us also to detach ourselves. But also at the same time, you feel like you are part of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult combination. I, I've, many people who I interviewed in, in, in the south of Chile have moved there because of the climate crisis. Because Santiago is, is, well, Santiago is not raining anymore. And you turn on the TV news, and it's like in 2015, we won't have any water. And many people have said that. I mean, we moved to the south a thousand kilometers because here you have water, you have lakes, you have rain. And it's like, we are only, <laughs> it's the same planet. Uh, <laughs> you can't escape from this. Um, perhaps if you are Mark Zuckerberg, you can build. Well, have you seen the bunker he, bunker he created? It's amazing in Hawaii. Um, but the rest of us can can really escape. No, nobody can really escape. No. Um, so it's, it's it's yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I, I got the mic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah. My comment is about like how different things are happening at the same time. I'm following in Finland such groups where. Uh, minimalistic groups, a bit uh, follow up by KonMari or something like that, where people are helped to get rid of stuff. And then they are explained that, yeah, you don't have to worry. First thing is to get rid of stuff. You don't have to worry where they go, if it's ecological, because it's a heavy package that you carry and you will feel better when you just uh, trash it. And like seeing all this and in a way, being also in the reality where <laughs> I have several grandmothers who have passed away and I have all of their uh, mm. um, stuff because I live in the biggest house <laughs> of the, the family and stuff just keeps coming through the door. And, and the, I have been irritated by the message those groups give because yeah. at least when I give away something, I want to know somehow that it, it might be reused. But also that is quite elitist idea. I think that someone should be happy about something that I don't want. And um, so, I mean, my question is, how do you reflect <laughs> on this minimalist uh, uh, ideology while there is this other huge thing going on uh, that you really, really, really nicely described here. Yeah. We wrote a piece about uh, Maricondo. Maricondo in Chile. <laughs> so Maricondo. It was against Maricondo. Before she regret uh, yeah. her lifestyle of minimalism and had kids and noticed that it was impossible. Uh, <laughs> And before opening a brand, now she exactly. sells things, so it's kind of... Uh, and, and the whole idea was very similar to what you're saying, like minimalism, yeah, if it, if it was the beginning at the, and the end at the same time and you won't get more things and you won't get rid of things, it's perfect. But in a way, you have to get rid of stuff, that, that's one thing. Uh, the things you keep have to be perfect have to be intact, time doesn't pass there, is, is very aesthetic. Minim, minim, there's no, you can't see where, you can't see traces of time there. So it's clearly something that is not sustainable in time. And at the same time, when you think about 
repair and you go into uh, work, working class houses, uh, repair, reuse, repurpose, you need stuff all the time. You need material. You need, and you need to save things for the future. It's like, what I have in my house is my capital, is what I can there then share, what I can invest, what I can use, what I can give someone away. So it also builds community. Uh, people talked about like how if the neighbor needs something, he will go into his garage and say, well, perhaps I have something that you can use because I saved it for later. And, and that idea is absolutely absent in the minimalism discourse. Uh, the minimalism discourse doesn't work if it's not, there's not a market where I can go and buy and I have that capacity of buying. Also, you have to have like an emotional relation. Exactly, with, you have to pick every or... item and see if it talks to you. If it shines. It's like... Mm. I we, cannot hold emotional bonds with all my items. That is absolutely... I don't shine that much. <laughs> no. We all have a, a drawer, usually in the entrance of our homes, no? Where we keep things like paper clips and, and keys and paper. Our nightstands also. Yeah. Full of stuff. Full of apparently useless stuff. Uh, our pockets. I move a lot and, and my wife always wants to throw up my big box of cables. Always. But then... She's always like, oh, do you have this adapter for the... Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> yes, I have, I have two. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, you use them. And if you don't use them, as you said, you should, you should look for a better place for them. But it's, it's the same, Tila, there's a lot of people advocating for getting rid of stuff, like yeah. for having the minimum amount of things with no reflection on it, like just, no, we have to have a minimum. Uh, yeah, we actually are running out of time now for She's this. Standing up. Ah, okay, yeah, so the <laughs> final question. She's quite ready. One, yeah, <laughs> She's quite ready. final yeah. question, <laughs> short one, please. Yeah, so Imre Troifeld from Degrowth Estonia. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see that there is this conflict be between having a nice aesthetic place to live Uh, with maybe minimal minimum amount of items versus having a pile of stuff uh, and like I saw some of those pictures that you showed from the countryside of Chile where people had their backyard just like a junkyard basically so uh, because people like aesthetics and people like things oftentimes to be clean and organized and in here we look around everything is like nice and you know And so, but to uh, to have kind of a sustainable lifestyle and to reuse things, uh, it looks like we need to have all kinds of stuff everywhere laying around. So, like, how do you? It's it's a psychological need to have a nice, clean space, I think. And how do you reconcile that with um, having to have all these things laying around that you can reuse? It's a psychological need. It's a cultural thing. Ah, okay, very good. Yeah. What we, is we? Sorry, okay. we, because you say trash or junk. junk. Mm -hmm. I come from an urban metropolitan environment, Thomas as well. And we move, we're not a partner yet, but we move to, <laughs> to a, a small city, like five, no, four hours out of Santiago, a couple, like 10 years ago, to open a school of sociology. And, and we don't have much countryside uh, past in our lives. And we went to do field work in the countryside. And the first thing we said, I remember like, Look at all the junk. Uh, but then we realize it's not junk. There are, it's, there are things, these are things lying down to be used. So it's a washing machine, so, but it's not, it's broken. It's a broken washing machine. But then it's transformed into a, a dog's house. Or a used refriger uh, refrigerator is used to store food. So it's not cold anymore, but it can be used for, to keep mice away. So everything has a mm -hmm. purpose or can have a future purpose. I know that works in a different mindset and you may need a more clean space, but then you can have a more clean space. I mean, we're not <laughs> moralists, oh. but you can take care of the things you have and, and make them circulate. Uh, and even when you think about what is a clean space, yeah. it's like th that kitchen that we saw in the rural space, that's clean. 
the, 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 the floor is dirt, but it's clean. So dirt is clean. Why don't we have dirt in our kitchen in the city? Obviously, we have other kinds of, city, yeah. other kinds of kitchens. But what is, when you say a pile of stuff, there is meaning there in your words. It, it, what is a pile of stuff? What, what do we mean when we say stuff? Like something is, is it negative stuff? Yeah, it has it looks, a negative. Yeah, and and that's part of what we're trying to move mm. on. Like, how do we change the way we signify and the meaning that is behind these very powerful words? Irvin is very powerful. New is very powerful. How do we think that it can be different? And also the rural, the the vertical, the collective. Take, take Mary Douglas, for example. No? The idea of there's not, no such thing as garbage, but place, things out of place. Everything has a place. Even garbage has a place. So for us, we see a washing machine in the backyard. It's garbage. But that's, for them, that's the place where they keep use washing machines. So it's okay. not dirt. Yeah. It's not, yeah. yeah. So it's basically a cultural issue that you just some people just like orderliness because of the the cultural social conditioning not because it's a basic psychological need which okay. is a good answer i think we can just change our culture <laughs> just to add here but it can be a psychological disorder as well hoarding hoarding you know hoarding. piling stuff yeah that's a different thing and ocd <laughs> Yeah. To have everything clean all uh -huh. the time is also a disorder. <laughs> and we will sure find other disorders related. <laughs> Thomas has <Yeah>. many. <laughs> yeah. okay. thank, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. We, we'll, we would like to have a big applause for oh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Tana. <laughs> uh, for the... Uh, a final word, or like I just just have some uh, practical uh, things uh, to say. Uh, uh, you all know that tomorrow we will have uh, this uh, tour to public initiatives. So we are going to repair workshops and uh, urban garden, and and uh, and we are seeing the uh, the food sharing network in Tartu. Uh, please. Those of you who are coming tomorrow, please sign sign up at the registration desk so we know how how, my, how many people are coming. But uh, now we have uh, we have coffee break, right? So uh, and after that we have parallel sessions. So uh, thank you and enjoy. <laughs>